All right. I think everyone is now uh, tuning into today's session. I'd like to want to welcome everyone to uh, this latest installment of the Hope, Healing, and Recovery Exchange. And we are in a two-part series here with a, a focus on leadership. And uh, today we'll be looking at looking back and in part two, looking at leading forward. So welcome everyone to today's session. I wanted to start with a land acknowledgement. I'll be using the land acknowledgement that's been developed here at my home organization, St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton. We recognize that the lands on which we provide care are the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee peoples. For thousands of years, the first people sought to steward the precious resources and share this land with others. These territories are the subject of the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant, an agreement between nations to peaceably share and care for the lands around the Great Lakes. We pledge to continue to walk together with Indigenous peoples in building a more just society where their gifts and those of all people are nurtured and honoured. We would also like to recognize National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, which is just around the corner on September the 30th. I'd like to draw your attention to this graphic among the various visual elements illustrated Indigenous cultures, the circle is at the center, which represents being together in the spirit of reconciliation. The orange color represents truth telling and healing. The pathway represents the road to reconciliation. First Nations, Inuit and Métis are represented in the image. The eagle to represent First Nations, the narwhal to represent Inuit, and the beaded flower to represent Métis. And so here we are gathered around to talk about uh, how we've been doing over these past couple of years. And um, I just wanted to draw your attention to a few, a few ground rules per se. Um, just know that uh, all participants will be muted during today's session. The chat box can be used to comment and ask questions during the Q&A. Uh, just a reminder that this event will be recorded and a list of resources and a link to an evaluation survey will be shared by email post session. And it's quite possible that some of the content today may be of a sensitive nature. And we've just asked that you just be respectful. And uh, if you uh, need support, please reach out uh, and we will give you a list of resources at the end. Just a reminder about the, the goals and the aims of these hope, healing and recovery exchanges. Um, they've been developed to honor the diverse experiences of health and community care workers in our community throughout the pandemic and promote collective reflection, mutual support, and recovery. The other aim is to hear personal stories of, of overcoming challenges and reflection from others on the front line of the pandemic, and lastly, to increase awareness of available resources. We're in our fourth installment of the Hope, Healing and Recovery Exchange. The other three are on YouTube and can be accessed quite easily. Um, and these are organized through the Health and Community Care Worker Wellness Working Group here at Hamilton. I'll just introduce myself briefly at this point. I am Dr. Joe Palazzari. I'm a clinical psychologist here at St. Joseph's Healthcare Hamilton with the Mental Health an addiction program and with palliative care. I've also been involved in staff support initiatives here at our hospital. And I'm coming to you today from my office here on the Charlton campus in downtown Hamilton. I'm here with a co-facilitator today. Sakib, uh, do you wanna introduce yourself? For sure, thanks Joe. Definitely don't have as much behind my name as yourself, but uh, so <laughs> hello everybody, my name is Sakib. Uh, I'm a co-facilitator for today. Currently, I'm a public health nurse working within the Healthy Families Division at uh, Hamilton Public Health uh, for the school health team. Previously, I was a uh, supervisor for the vaccine clinics during the peak of the uh, Omicron wave, where we were seeing up to 3,000, over 3,000 people a day at our clinic at the uh, Barton site. And after that, I was also the uh, supervisor for the vaccine ambassador team at uh, Hamilton Public Health. Um, so yeah, that's, that's me. 
Thanks, Sakib. And I, I just wanted to, to acknowledge um, and thank all of our partners today. Um, as you'll see, our group cuts across many sectors. Uh, in our previous uh, Hope Healing and Recovery Exchanges, we've had representation from our hospital sector, from care homes, from public health, from community agencies, and from primary care. And today we shift the focus a bit on leaders in all these sectors. Again, thank you to all our partners. And so, just to kick this off, we have a, a little bit of an engagement exercise and I'll, I'll pass it over to Saqib to, uh, to get people to think about this question using our Slido. Thank you, Joe. So yeah, we thought it'd be good to be a little interactive to start. So if everyone can please just go to uh, www.slido and enter the participant code uh, 350763. Uh, Sharon will also put the link in the chat. Uh, so you guys can just click that as well. It's probably a lot easier for you. Um, once you're in Slido, you're going to be prompted to just answer one question. And the question is, what was your greatest challenge as a leader during this pandemic? Uh, so please, in 10 words or less, share your thoughts on what you uh, or what was your greatest challenge during, during this pandemic. And I'm sure we're going to see a lot of different words and uh, a lot of different phrases. I think you can max out at 30 characters. So it really is 10 words or less. The uh, participant code is 350736. Oh, if you can just get that in the chat as well. It's in the center there. You can see a lot of different words coming up. Emotionally supporting staff, coping with employee burnout, burnout, supporting staff, staying connected with staff, Seeing a lot about, you know, leaders caring about their workers, which is always great to see. Stress. Separating working from home. Burnout. And for those of you that haven't used Slido before, the, the words that change colors or get bigger are ones that are a little more apparent. They're, they're more, you know, more people are typing them in. So it seems like burnout was, uh, was quite the big one uh, amongst people that are present here right now. Yeah, thanks everyone for, for participating in this. And uh, yeah, we, we, we see that quite bolded. Don't we, uh, Zach, get a burnout. Uh, and I, I think we've got the right guest speaker here today to talk about that. Um, but yeah, what, a, what an array of, of words and expressions here um, to cover all of what you've been dealing with over the last couple of years as leaders. And uh, maybe some of you are, are, are care workers as well. Um, um, but uh, quite an array here, uh, uncertainty, uh, and then also a little, a little bit on some, some coping kind of strategies in here as well. Um, but yeah, anxiety, never getting a break, hopelessness, um, feeling drained. So thank you very much. And, and I hope that everyone through this exercise uh, is, is kind of getting a bit primed for um, the next segment of, of today's session. All right, Sakab, any, any other reflections on, on what you're seeing emerge here? I Honestly, I think we're seeing a common theme of people caring about their staff, which is beautiful to witness. And then just that, that level yeah. of burnout that leaders feel that maybe, you know, the front line can't, can't notice or understand. So it's, I think we like you, you hit the nail on the head. We got the perfect speaker to talk about burnout and, and uh, leading yeah. forward. Yeah, and there seems to be like, you know, leaders, leaders are dealing with their own, uh, their own kind of sense of stress and anxiety and kind of holding that and at the same time caring for um, the people that they lead. Uh, it's, 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 quite, it's quite a demand. Um, so thank you everybody for participating in that engagement uh, exercise. And, uh, and so, let's, so let's just kind of shift uh, to our uh, guest speaker today. And um, I'm just, I'm really pleased and honored uh, to, to be able to introduce uh, Dr. Robert Monder. 
And uh, he's with us today to share evidence of the impact of the pandemic on health and community care organizations, its leaders and staff. Bob Mondor is a professor of psychiatry at the University of Toronto. He holds the Chair of Health and Behavior at Sinai Health System in Toronto, where he's also Deputy Psychiatrist-in-Chief and Head of Psychiatry Research. He had led a CIHR-funded study of the impact of the pandemic on healthcare workers' mental health and the benefits of peer support. In September 2021, he led an Ontario Science Table Brief on burnout in healthcare workers. I have my copy right here. Um, burnout in hospital-based healthcare workers during COVID-19 from the Ontario COVID-19 Science Advisory Table. So real pleasure uh, to have you here with us today, Bob, to uh, share uh, what you've been learning uh, in your study, uh, kind of digging deeply into the literature, uh, and then also with the projects that you've been leading uh, in at Sinai. So uh, over to you, Dr. Monter. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Um, uh, looking forward to um, sharing a little bit on this is on the, the looking back portion to uh, set us up for the looking forward portion in the next session. Um, and because I'm uh, looking back on an experience that all of us have um, shared in different ways. I probably won't be telling you very much that you don't already know um, from your own perspective, uh, but I'll, I'll try and frame things in, in a way that um, uh, uh, facilitates um, uh, discussion going forward about um, the challenges of leadership um, over the last couple of years and uh, in the future. Next slide. So uh, I, I'm starting with this definition of wellness, um, uh, which it doesn't come from me, it comes from a wellness working group at uh, our faculty of medicine. Um, and I like it um, for two reasons. One, because it is complex. Um, and so uh, it's helpful to think of, um, of well-being as a many layered thing. Um, but especially because it locates wellness in an interaction between people and their organizations and their, the system that we're all in, the healthcare system and our culture. So it locates wellness between people. And I think it's, it's really helpful to think about wellness, to think about health, um, to think about resilience as something that happens between people. Um, and in the Slido, when um, the suffering and burnout, the impact that this has had on so many people was really prominent. And that the other uh, prominent theme that I picked out there was uh, connection and support and uh, what happens in between people that um, uh, uh, either makes that uh, worse or better, depending on the circumstances. Next slide. Um, so this is um, a, um, uh, a, a, a graphic that from the, uh, that science brief on burnout. Um, and I put it up not to go through the, the, the bullets in detail, but just to make a couple of general points of, about burnout, particularly burnout in healthcare, um, uh, in that there are a multitude of contributing factors that increase the risk of burnout for healthcare workers. Um, there are some of them that are uh, individual factors. Um, so uh, being younger and having less experience, for example, is, is a pretty strong contributor to burnout. Uh, but there are far more that occur at the organizational level. So it's really helpful to think of, of burnout, I think, as um, an individual consequence of organizational um, uh, experiences and factors. And then uh, uh, burnout has many consequences, some for individual, the individuals who's experiencing burnout, but in healthcare also for our patients and indeed for the organization, right? And so we're experiencing now um, uh, uh, staffing um, uh, challenges that are occurring for many reasons, but one of those reasons is uh, the burnout that people have experienced over the last couple of years and that introduces the idea of a, of a vicious circle, because of increased workload and hours and shifts, too much to do and not enough time to do it, not enough people to do it, contributes to burnout. 
and that in turn makes people uh, less available to do the work and less uh, willing to do the work, then we get in this vicious cycle, which I think is a part of what's contributing to what I'm thinking of as a kind of sustained crisis in healthcare right now. Next slide. So this is some data from uh, the study that we've been doing. We've been doing this at uh, in uh, my healthcare organization at Sinai Health uh, 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 over the last uh, two years. Um, uh, and I, uh, it's it's worth noting that I I don't think there's anything special about Sinai Health in this respect. I think this is probably representative of healthcare organizations in general. Uh, in some senses, there, there's reason to think that this might be a kind of best case, at least in, in terms of local, local circumstances. Um, and so we've been uh, surveying staff at three month intervals. Uh, this is showing uh, how people have been doing with respect to emotional exhaustion, which is one element of burnout, over um, seven of these measurements every three months. So from the fall of 2020 to the spring of 2022. And you can see we've superimposed the COVID case rate in the background to get a sense of kind of how this matches what's going on in our environment. Uh, and there's a, a couple of things to uh, point out about uh, this data. Um, so one is that these rates of burnout are extraordinarily high. So what, uh, what was the norm um, pre-pandemic uh, when measuring burnout in the way that we're showing it here? would have been rates somewhere between 20 and 40%. So uh, instead of that, we're uh, seeing rates uh, around 70% in the most affected group, which in this data uh, are, uh, uh, is nurses. And that's the second thing to highlight is that it's not the same for all occupations. It's not the same for all roles. And really consistently nurses have been um, the most affected identifiable group in the in uh, hospitals, including in ours. So those are extraordinarily high rates of burnout, highest in nurses. Then that orange line that this the next down is all other healthcare professionals, um, and then below that, um, uh, all the other people that work in the hospital who see they're broken up into those who see patients and those who don't see patients. Um, the, Another thing to, to note is that these lines go up and down, right? So they're not static and they're also not just continuously increasing. It hasn't just been a cumulative burden over the course of the, the pandemic. They, they rise and fall um, and they rise and fall roughly in proportion to uh, the waves of the, of, of, um, uh, the COVID cases. Um, uh, so, at, but they all kind of rise and fall together. All, if you look at the different groups, they're all rising and falling on the same tide. So that um, suggests to me two things. One is it's encouraging that they go down as well as going up. It, it suggests that there are things that we can do that will um, uh, help the burden of burnout. Um, but because they're all going up and down together and they're going more or less in synchrony with the case rates, it also suggests that focusing on individuals uh, to try and build resilience is um, probably focusing at the wrong level, that it's, it's the organizational, cultural, environmental factors that are probably the strongest drivers of burnout. Next slide. Um, so I, I highlighted some of the um, uh, predictors of greater levels of burnout that we find in, in uh, this study. Um, and I emphasize them because I think they're generalizable. I don't think this is uh, specific to the organization that we were studying. So nurses were the most vulnerable um, being younger, which means having less experience in healthcare um, uh, is another pretty strong predictive factor. That's really important right now because of the staffing challenges we've got. It's resulting in bringing on more people who are earlier in their career and having less of uh, more veteran healthcare uh, workers as part of the workforce. So there's a, there's a, a shift in our workforce towards younger people um, and you know, leaping ahead to what, what should we do? It suggests the need for um, training and mentorship and support for uh, people who are, are early in their career who are working in hospitals right now. 
moral distress has been a really potent um, contributor to um, uh, strain in general and burnout in, in particular. Um, and uh, self-efficacy, which, so that's jargon, but that's really just confidence in your ability to do what you need to do. So people who have felt confident in their ability to deal with the pandemic have done better um, psychologically which may feel self-evident, but it's really helpful because that is uh, that response to training. So when people are well-trained in the tasks that um, they need to do, they um, tend to experience less burnout. Next slide. So uh, this is a uh, lovely painting of a sea storm. Um, that I slapped a uh, cartoon onto um, to, uh, so that it would uh, tell a story. Uh, I'm, I'm right about to uh, head out to Prince Edward Island uh, after we finish up today because my wife has been out there uh, weathering uh, Hurricane Fiona. So the, the, the sea storm feels like all the more potent metaphor to me right now. Um, so I, 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 I put this together just to make the, the, the point that in the midst of this kind of uh, stressful chaos, uh, turning to individuals uh, to try and make them stronger, to just withstand what they're going through is probably a misguided uh, approach to resilience. I don't think I'm telling anything that you don't know, but I just wanted to emphasize it with a little cartoon. Next slide. So there are, there are many contributors to burnout, determinants of burnout, and I think it's really helpful to focus on the ones that are actually modifiable, right? to, uh, to turn our attention to what can we change um, with we, broadly speaking, because not everybody has the, the um, uh, 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 power and resources to be able to change each of these things. But at different levels of the healthcare system and organization, there are things that are modifiable that can improve the well being of our uh, healthcare force and ourselves. Uh, first and foremost, um, uh, appropriate workload and adequate staffing. So, um, uh, the the uh, I don't know um, uh, exactly how things in your organizations. There's people from many different organizations who are who are tuned in today. But there's there are a lot of places right now that are working on uh, what we uh, locally are calling a contingency basis. It maybe has other names in other organizations, but where we're um, um, uh, doing the best we can with less staff than um, uh, than would be optimal for um, for doing the work that we do, and clearly uh, the, everything that can be done to address that uh, improves the the well being of the workers. Uh, workplace safety, broadly speaking, again self efficacy, which is what I was referring to before. So. Um, uh, buddying, support, training, mentoring, all the things we can do to, to allow people to feel more confident at the tasks that they have to do at work uh, is better for their well-being and especially for um, people who are earlier in their careers. Um, uh, support, um, uh, psychological supports, one of the things that um, uh, came out in the wordo at the beginning. Um, it's helpful to note that um, what's kind of uh, within our grasps to provide to uh, healthcare workers within uh, large organizations tend to be relatively formal supports. So peer support programs or other kinds of professional supports or get access to mental health resources, things that can be organized at a, at a at literally at an organizational level. In general, healthcare workers tend to use informal supports much more than formal supports. So the thing that's available for us to provide is probably the thing that is less attractive and maybe even less effective for healthcare workers. So uh, uh, support from colleagues, peers, friends, and family tends to have more oomph than the kind of formal supports that are available for us to put into place. 
I'm talking to a group of leaders and it's helpful to know that your uh, effective leadership is a protective factor for all of the people within the organizations in which you're leading. Visible leadership, not having all the answers, but being present um, is um, uh, very valuable to everybody that works within a uh, healthcare organization. Um, many interpersonal determinants of um, uh, burnout and burdens on well being in healthcare organizations. And often these, the kind of interpersonal things that are worth identifying and th that we can uh, address well to improve things are occurring at the level of um, units and departments. It tends to be the kind of uh, interpersonal conflicts and tensions that arise in, in uh, chronic stressful situations. And so identifying hotspots and, um, uh, and uh, intervening to improve how people are, are communicating and getting along with one another helps everybody there. Uh, and then all the other stuff that tends to be what, it, what occurs to us first, um, but is, is maybe not always the, the most important um, or the, the most impactful, you know, providing opportunities for uh, relaxation and meditation and, um, uh, and uh, other kind of uh, wellness initiatives. Next slide. Um, so we're moving towards um, uh, what will be helpful going forward, which is going to be our topic next time. Um, uh, this is a this is a um, helpful framework that Tate Shanafelt, who's been doing burnout research in the states for years, uh, has uh, put together, um, looking at the different uh, drivers within large organizations, within healthcare organizations, which. Uh, when they go well, lead to um, uh, engagement in vigorous organizations, and when they go poorly, lead to burnout. Uh, so uh, this is one of those uh, graphics that looks like it's describing something complex when in fact it's just a list. Um, so um, uh, attention to workload, um, everything we can do to optimize um, uh, the control and flexibility that people have over their workplace, which often uh, comes down to things like scheduling, uh, promoting work-life integration, uh, finding ways to facilitate uh, social support within the community and at work, um, organizational culture and values that are, are um, uh, not just adopted in, in word by the organization, but are, but are kind of lived within the culture of the organization. Uh, and in particular, um, allowing people to find meaning in their work. Next slide. So this is, I've, I'm uh, finishing off with a short list. This is a bit of a, an off the cuff list about um, uh, what might uh, apply specifically to leaders within organizations. And I'm not making any attempt to be comprehensive or authoritative here. This is not based on research. Um, it's I'm really just a springboard to uh, the discussion uh, that we're going to have, uh, where I'm really interested to hear um, the uh, perspectives of the people in the, attending the webinar today about what the experience of being a leader within a healthcare organization has been like over the last uh, couple of years. So uh, the way I, that I thought to frame with this was that all of the things that I've described for um, uh, healthcare workers, broadly speaking, apply to leaders as well, um, plus some uh, additional special concerns. Um, which include how to lead in the context of great uncertainty uh, about what's going to happen, let alone what to do with it, about it. Very limited resources and no available fixes for problems that are very evident. Um, the actual, the role of leader and how that can constrain a person from um, acknowledging, expressing, dealing with uh, their own individual burdens, um, because each of us experience that regardless of our role within the organization. 
But if your role is to be the one who listens or the one who fixes, if you're trying to mentor others who are um, uh, dealing with these stressors, if you're the one who has to make decisions about how resources are distributed, uh, it, it really doesn't facilitate you at the same time acknowledging your own, your own difficulties and troubles, right? And I think that, that is a, a strain that has been common for leaders. Uh, somewhat related to that, but a little bit more um, uh, emotional and interpersonal is that it's embarrassing to look weak. Um, and the, the culture of leadership, I think, can emphasize that. Um, and uh, it may or may not apply to uh, widely, but I've certainly heard um, uh, people in leadership positions um, talking about the strain they feel and their own um, individual values and goals don't align or, don't, or, or they experience some tension between those and um, the goals and values of their corporation, which they're um, um, giving voice to and uh, trying to enact. There's probably more bullet points on there and I'd be, I'm keen to hear um, uh, whether any of that resonates with uh, people who are attending here today. And I think that's the end. Yep. Thanks, Dr. Monger, um, for taking us through that. Uh, it's a, a large volume of material there, and I, you know, I found, found myself kind of jotting a few things down along the way, and I, I hope uh, everyone who's who's tuning in today has been doing the same thing. And um, you know, Sakib and I are are are. Um, are uh, over the next 15 minutes or so, going to facilitate a, a further conversation with with Dr. Monter. So, so please uh, please ask questions um, and uh, ask for clarification. Um, we will be using some of the themes brought up today um, to talk more about in our next installment of this, which will be on October the um, October the 12th. Um, and uh, we'll also have uh, a, another co-facilitator who uh, is a leader uh, talking about her story. Um, so anyone wish to kick off the conversation today with, with a question? You know what, we actually, Joe, we already have a question in the Q&A, so I'm just going to read that out. Oh, thanks, Sakib. I, oh, no I, 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 was, I was hoping you were monitoring that. Good. Yeah, no, for sure. So we had a uh, one question come in so far. Curious to know, um, in the nurse category, were only frontline nurses included in this, or would this also include nurses who are also leaders? Oh, yeah. So that uh, a question specifically about about the data that so that just refers to how we sorted people because because each um, each participant in the survey uh, identified their specific role and um, and then we sorted them into categories. So the way that we did it, um, nursing leaders would have appeared as nurses. So um, uh, just because uh, the vast majority of nurses in a hospital are um, providing frontline care, the vast majority of, of um, people in that category would have been frontline nurses, but it also would have included um, uh, uh, nursing leaders and uh, nursing researchers and uh, nurses who are doing other other work within the organization, they would have been lumped in there. Oh, now the questions are coming through. There we go. Okay. I, I thought I'd uh, done something terrible and made everybody feel like they wanted to stay silent. Oh, no, no. Trust me. As, as you were speaking, Dr. Mondra, I was, I was focusing back on my time. I used to work in eMERGE, and your research looked at eMERGE nurses and ICU nurses. And one of the big things in your research mentioned, you know, balancing, like, we don't think we're heroes. We're trying to get the job done. But how do you balance the two? So it's like, I think even a lot of what you spoke to today about burnout and how do you feel as a leader and supporting your staff? I'm sure people are just at a loss for how to word what they want to say. Um, well, you, you use the word you use the word hero, so it just it reminds me of another theme, which is which is worth identifying, I think, and that's that that they um, uh, uh, 
because this has been such a long period of time and the, the dynamics and the politics of uh, the pandemic and dealing with the pandemic have changed so much over time, I think we as healthcare workers have all had to live with kind of having a different relationship with our um, uh, society and kind of uh, uh, in, uh, environment, uh, which itself has been a contributor to uh, burnout and strain, right? So at, at the beginning of the pandemic, we were all heroes, right? Um, which doesn't always feel like such a great fit. Like that can be a little bit stressful because like most of us don't feel heroic. We're just like, as you say, trying to, trying to do a job. Um, but it sure feels better than being um, vilified as, as some, you know, pawns in some kind of tyrannical overreach when people are protesting outside the hospital about uh, vaccines and whatnot. And so that, like the the shift in um, um, uh, uh, kind of uh, how we appear in other people's eyes over the course of the pandemic has been just a... Um, a roller coaster and I think a, a huge strain for a lot of people. Oh, for sure, for sure. Uh, so I'll yeah. oh, go ahead, Joe. I, I just wanted to jump in on something. You know, in our posters for the Hope Healing and Recovery Exchange, we, we have one of those, uh, like a depiction of a healthcare worker with, you know, the plastic thing that kind of held your, your mask on with hero in there. And, and those, those were made by, by forensic psychiatry patients here. Um, so I always like to point that out because it came from patients, right? And and uh, but but absolutely uh, a charged word uh, uh, throughout uh, the pandemic response. I just wanted to share that. All right, so the list is coming in. Uh, yes, yeah, we got, we got five questions. Let me just go through the first one then. So it just begins with a thank you, Dr. Monder, for the presentation. Would you be able to share thoughts on how healthcare organizations may formalize, incorporate, or promote informal support uh, in formal settings? Yeah, so it's a tricky thing because there's a bit of a paradox, right? Right. So, like, how how can we um, formally incorporate informal supports into our organizations, right? I mean, I so. Um, uh, so I'm, my my first response to that is is my first response to all good questions, which is I don't know, um, but a couple of thoughts. Um, uh, one is that those those informal supports, so peer to peer, for example, can be facilitated by putting peers together in circumstances in which they have an opportunity to pause and reflect. Right. So. Um, uh, various ways in which we've been able to put kind of um, uh, protected, a little bit of protected time that is often facilitated to encourage uh, peers to be uh, reflective and support one another it can be really helpful when, when that can be managed. There's the informal support from family and friends and that we encourage by um, uh, uh, all of the kind of uh, policy, uh, policies and culture that we can put in place that promotes work-life balance, right? Because people get that support by not being at work. Um, uh, and then I, I think in a in a way that's that's hard to measure, but I think real, um, uh, an organization that has a, a strong and positive, healthy culture is an organization that allows people to make connections with one another, right? Um, and uh, those um, friendships and peer relationships and collegial relationships um, can be uh, very sustaining. And there's nothing, that we, there's no specific buttons that we can press or, or places that we can push our money towards that encourage that. But that's a, that's a kind of individual benefit that comes out of uh, strong, healthy organizational culture. I, I was reflecting on that too, like this this issue of like kind of individual versus organizational, and um, you know, because I'm very much involved in offering um, elbow to elbow supports uh, for for healthcare workers, um, and in thinking about that, I you know I'm always mindful of that, like it's not a standalone thing, um, that that it's it's part of a like a network of supports within organizations. Um, uh, with all kind of like the same kind of intention or objective. Uh, Bob, did that make sense? And kind of like in, in kind of thinking about this range of individual versus organizational um, efforts to prevent burnout? 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's a, a the 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 things that are helpful are 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 um, a web, right? Yeah. Of, of things that that reinforce one another um, effectively or don't, right? So I, that, like it, um, uh, we for sure are not kind of aiming towards an intervention, right? Like a thing that you can do, and then your people will be okay. Like there's nothing that's going to come off the shelf, um, but but attention to. Uh, like each of these things and as you say at different levels so individuals and units departments the organization the way the organization interacts with its community like um uh, attention to all of these things is each is helping the other kind of goes back to that um um uh, uh, uh interactive target of well-being that i started with right oh, thanks thanks for that clarification we uh, we have quite a few questions. I don't think we'll be able to get to them all, but I'll just go through which ones came in first. Um, yeah, so and let's and let's and let's let's find a way to 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 keep those questions for for the next installment too. Okay. Yeah. Smart ideas. So it's, this is why you're the the big boss facilitator. <laughs> uh, so another question that came in was uh, that clinical leaders in particular have a very stressful role to support their teams, uh, but also address family issues. What insight do you have about why leaders seem to be coping less now than earlier? Uh, coping less well now than earlier? I, I believe that was the intention of the question, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, I have to speculate because like with all good questions, I don't know. Um, the um, um, uh, So a, a couple of things, I think. One, one of them is that... Um, uh, when when you're I, I think when you're in a leadership position you you can focus on on uh focus on the task and get through for a long period of time right but at the beginning of this we talked about how it's a marathon and not a sprint um and then as things proceeded it seemed like well it seems might, like it might be longer than a marathon right um and at some point um uh, uh when things have kind of improved enough that you can look around and reflect on how you're feeling, then um, uh, you may notice that in fact, you've been kind of running on empty for a while, right? And so there, at a personal level, I think there's a, um, a awareness of coping less well um, may have uh, waited until there was a little bit of breathing space, right? I always remember the, we're in the old, um, uh, Roadrunner cartoons: How the uh, how the Roadrunner would run over the cliff, or the Coyote would run over the cliff. And as long as he didn't look down, he could run right back, right? But as soon as he looked down, he fell, right? Um, and so I think there's been opportunities to kind of pause and look down um, uh, recently. Um, uh, and the other thing is just like the the sustained exhaustion, and now we're in this um, really stressful. Um, uh, circumstance in, in healthcare that is no longer following the case rates and, and has a kind of um, uh, longer term sustained implications. Like, how are we going to maintain this when we're uh, understaffed and the news would tell us that the pandemic is over and um, we don't feel like we're operating as normal and we don't see that like immediately on the horizon, right? It's a, it's a hard time in which to lead. And the, the last thought is, if you're talking about clinical leaders, clinical, I mean, it depends on what organization you're in, but in my experience, a lot of clinical leaders tend to be kind of um, uh, somewhere in the middle of a leadership hierarchy. Um, and so they're uh, both um, uh, uh, trying to lead the people who are uh, reporting to them and looking to them for leadership. Uh, and they're answerable to uh, to others who are giving them um uh, uh, guidance and instruction on how they should be leading. And this uh, kind of uh, caught in the middle place can be um, uh, uncomfortable. We have about um, uh, about four, four minutes left. We do like to end these at around the 10 to mark just to give uh, people an opportunity to have a stretch and get on with their next uh, commitment, but but maybe uh, another another question, uh, Sakib, and then and then we'll we'll do some organization of the themes from the other 
things that have come up in the chat. Yeah, you know what, for sure. Let me uh, let me get the, the next question that came in then. This one was actually quite interesting. Uh, so spiritual care providers seek supportive gestures for frontline workers. So while acknowledging that their workload is higher than normal, are there any suggestions for tangible gestures of support that don't take away precious breaks or, or lunch times uh, from, from the staff? Um, that's, that's a great question. Um, uh, I think, I think it depends, it depends a lot on kind of the local circumstances, right? So I, I, I don't know that I've got a, a, a um, uh, a great suggestion there. Um, and certainly I don't have one that, that focuses specifically on, on spiritual care, but I, but, um, um, so I'll, I'll share a, short list of, of things that have been have been useful when our um, um, care resilience support people have gone to different units. Um, so uh, sometimes actually just like presence is helpful, right? Especially if you already have a relationship with people, if you if you already are known to um, kind of be helpful and have an alliance and, and be supportive, then uh, just being around with a quick how's it going and um, and you know sharing an eye roll at whatever has been um, uh, a strain recently can be really helpful and doesn't take a lot of time. Um, uh, we uh, at a we can't enact this at a at the level of somebody uh, visiting a unit like whether they're in uh, spiritual care or in a, or another discipline. But you know one of them the uh, most consistently um, uh, helpful um, uh, and appreciated things in our organization has been um, when the leadership has been able to find somebody to sponsor free coffee for a day or a week. It's just um, never ceases to amaze me how effective that is. I think it's fabulously expensive. I don't actually know how much that costs. I think it costs a fortune, but I, that like that's a fortune that's well spent and doesn't uh, cost any time to anybody, just cost money. All right, folks. Um, Saka, what one last one, or should or should we call it? Ooh, let me see. You know what? Actually, the next one's a really good one too. I say I say we ask it because we still have quite a few attendees. Questions are coming in. People are engaged. What do you say? Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's keep. keep are you okay to, to keep it going, Bob? Yeah, we won't have time for the answer, but let's get the question. All right, yeah. so the question is, how do we support healthcare workers to adjust to the new norm as things likely will not return to the pre-pandemic? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. You know, that if, if, there's, um, if there's any silver lining, I hate to even use the, frame, the phrase silver lining when it comes to what we've been through over the last couple of years, uh, it's the all of the effort that has gone into um, trying to figure out how to support one another and to um, uh, uh, help ourselves with our own uh, health and healing and, and resilience and, and help others. Um, and so I think that's I, I think I hope that is part of whatever the, the new normal turns out to be is that the new normal is a little bit more attentive to, um, uh, to our well-being and to, and to, to uh, trying to support that. Um, and I'll just throw in, I said it before, but it's so important. I just want to say it again. Part of the new normal is we have a younger uh, workforce right now, right? And um, we just have to be really cognizant of uh, how we can um, help our youngest colleagues to um, be confident in what they're doing and to be developing uh, healthy work habits. Oh yeah, for sure. And I, I think of our learners too, in, in many of our organizations, being yeah. especially vulnerable. Um, a, a message came up from Sharon, one of our organizers. Uh, we're we're going to collect all the questions. We want to make sure that we honor and respect uh, the effort that you made to kind of put a question forward. Um, and if you're not able to attend the next one, then, you know, we're going to try to find a way to get that answered and, and to you and, and, and some kind of reaction from us. Um, uh, but I, but I, but I think at this point we are, um, we're, we're going to, we're going to call it a day. Um, thank you so much for, for your engagement. So uh, Sakab, uh, thanks for, for monitoring that chat. Uh, it sounds like it was, it was, it was kind of uh, building some steam there. Hey. Um, and so many important issues that are coming up that I really hope that you kind of tune into uh, the second installment, which is about kind of 
leading forward, uh, where um, it will be almost exclusively Q and A, um, and uh, and then you know we'll try to come up with maybe with uh, some solutions. Um, but uh, you know what these are about too, right? It's about connecting with each other, and we have connections from across so many sectors here today. Um, and my understanding is e even even beyond Hamilton. So welcome to everybody. I really, really hope that you found something helpful in coming here today, uh, maybe to charge your batteries a bit, fill your tanks a bit, um, and uh, benefit from the, the connection, the validation, and, uh, and, and of course, the content too. Um, I wanted to thank uh, all of our partners from, um, uh, from the Health and Community Care Worker Wellness Working Group, um, uh, to the people supporting us uh, behind the scenes, uh, Sharon Munn for, for, from, from Public Health for organizing us, uh, uh, Nicole Viancourt and the communications folks from St. Joe's Hamilton, uh, my co-facilitator Sakub, um, our guest for today, Dr. Maunder, thank you for being here and, and for, for joining us for the next one as well. And lastly, uh, thank you. Thank you everyone um, uh, for joining us today. Um, Sakib, if you could just kind of put up the, the slide around resources um, and uh, please stay well and, and, and thank you all for everything that you're doing in your, in your roles uh, during the pandemic. And I hope to see you again on the 12th of October. Uh, Sakib, uh, you wanna just kind of um, uh, run through some of these resources? Yes, for sure, yeah. So we just wanna take this opportunity to uh, encourage everyone to take advantage of any existing resources uh, available through your own organizations and others, uh, ones that are open to all healthcare community workers across Hamilton. Uh, so some of these include COVID-19 mental health services through St. Joe's, um, our resilience support toolkit through the Hamilton Health Sciences, uh, COAST for immediate crisis support, Ontario provincial COVID-19 support for healthcare workers, and the uh, Physician Wellness Plus initiative from the College of Family Physicians of Canada. Go to the uh, next slide. And then I just wanna finally say, uh, we would like to remind everyone that, as Joe said earlier, part two of this leadership series is scheduled for October 12th. Registration is still open. So if you enjoyed today, please sign up for the next one as well. Uh, and you can share this information with any colleagues. Dr. Monder will be back to discuss strategies for supporting leaders moving forward. Um, and we will hear from Bahar Karimi, a registered nurse and an administrator at the Idlewild Manor and chair of research uh, Thrive Group, who will share her story leading through the pandemic and will provide lessons learned and uh, tips for other leaders. Uh, and if you haven't already registered, the link will be circulated with the, uh, the post event email. And once again, I just want to thank everyone for coming today. It was a uh, pleasure. Thank you, everyone.